It all began a couple of months ago when I reconnected with some friends of mine from college. We spent many evenings in a Discord call, playing and spectating challenge runs of various Pokemon games. We're all pretty big fans of the games, and if you've been on certain corners of the internet for as many years as I have, one specific type of personal challenge is inescapable. The Nuzlocke. This challenge was popularized by a webcomic in 2010, and swept the Pokemon community by storm, inspiring artists, YouTubers, and fans to put their skills to the test versus this tougher version of the game series. If you look it up, it seems almost like a Let's Player Rite of Passage or something. People must watch this stuff for breakfast. At the time, with the exception of brand spanking new games, the types of Pokemon Let's Plays that tended to perform the best were Nuzlocke's. So, what's the big idea? Why are people fans of this challenge? The Nuzlocke is the same as a regular playthrough of a Pokemon game, but with the addition of three basic rules. Rule 1. If a Pokemon faints, it is considered dead, and you can no longer use it. Rule 2. You can only catch the first Pokemon you find in an area, and nothing else. And one more got tacked on later. Rule 3. You must nickname every Pokemon you catch. The first rule seems like a fairly logical change for Pokemon if you're looking to make the game harder. I played a fair number of Fire Emblem games and know firsthand how difficult adding permanent death to characters in RPGs can make them. It benefits the gameplay, forcing you to increase the level of care you need to use when approaching battles, and punishes you for negligence. The second rule limits what Pokémon you catch, forcing you to play with companions that might be objectively weaker than other options available to you. This ensures you make the best of what you are given. But what really interests me, and what I think completes the experience, is the third rule. Unlike the first two rules, nicknaming Pokemon adds no mechanical difficulty to the games themselves. Honestly, it's something I'd already been doing when playing the game since childhood. However, it might be obvious why this increases the game's difficulty when combined with the first rule. When one goes through the process of naming a Pokemon, its eventual death can hurt the player more easily. If you haven't played much Pokemon before, I imagine you might be scratching your head a little bit. It's easy to picture being inconvenienced by the fake, self-imposed death of a virtual video game pet, but hurt? How can you get hurt by something like this? I think it's a little tempting to tell the people playing Kitty Nintendo Dogfighting Simulator to go pick up a football if they're so upset about their poor leaflet the Bulbasaur getting one hit KO'd. But, after finishing a run myself, I think I can empathize. A few days after crowding around with my buddies to watch the premiere of a really excellent Jade in Animations video on her experience nuzlocking, I decided it was time for me to finish one myself. I had attempted nuzlocks of Pokemon games before, and they were all met with failure either due to my team getting wiped or losing an individual key member that I just didn't have the motivation to try and replace. This time, however, I decided it would be different. I vowed to complete the game no matter the cost, and would power through the setbacks laid out in my way. I, um, grabbed my old copy of Platinum and booted it up. After selecting Quincy the Chimchar and playing for 71 in-game hours, I had defeated Cynthia and seized my spot as champion of the Sinnoh region. I had succeeded at something where past me had failed, primarily because of my own skill and determination, but something wasn't right. I was still unhappy. I lost 8 Pokemon over the course of my run, but the other 7 were less devastating than the loss of my Gyarados, which I had named Cabaret. I found him in a puddle that resided in the game's starting area, and he made it all the way until the end, murdered by Cynthia's Togekiss's shockwave after hitting it within inches of being KO'd. At many periods during the run, Cabaret bailed me out of tough situations and took on the most difficult trainers. 
During the fight with Cynthia, my plan was to use Cabaret's Dragon Dance to boost its speed and attack, and then plow my way through the champion's team with ease. However, when the fight occurred, I decided that three boosts were adequate, instead of the possible six I could have gone for. And as a result, Cynthia's Pokemon persevered with the tiniest sliver of hit points. If I had been just a little bit more patient, and we're talking like 10 seconds here, the death could have easily been prevented. Ultimately, the death of Cabaret had little importance to my victory during the fight against Cynthia. I was completely overprepared, and had solid answers for every single other Pokemon on her team. Honestly, being forced to think on my feet each turn to navigate the fight safely was probably more fun than just killing every Pokemon in one hit because of Dragon Dance. It was the end of the run anyway, so I wouldn't need Cabaret after the final fight regardless, but I was pretty disappointed with the fact that I had let such a treasured Pokemon get killed because of my own carelessness. I might be showing a little bit of the millennial in me, but there's this phenomenon that arose in the late 90s that this whole situation reminded me of, called the Tamagotchi effect. Tamagotchis were these little plastic video games you could buy, where you could raise and care for creatures as they grew up, and they would develop an appearance and personality based on how attentive you were. They were this big trend in the US and Japan, and while it was a little bit before my time, I definitely remember seeing them around growing up. When you hatch a new Tamagotchi, you have to understand that it's like us all, born to die. Even the most cared for Tamagotchi will die someday, for the same reason that people do, old age. You can mess up and let them get sick and they can die early, but death is inevitable no matter what you do, so an entire generation of people playing these games were subject to the grief and loss of their tiny digital companions. For many, this was their first experience with death, and it was significant. The Tamagotchi effect is this emotional attachment and personification of objects in computer programs. The act of grieving for a Tamagotchi is the same phenomenon as my sadness for Cabaret. People have handled this grief in all kinds of ways. There are real cemeteries for dead Tamagotchi, as well as large memorial pages on long dead forums lamenting the loss of virtual pets. People doing nuzlocks have their own equivalents. Browsing the subreddit for nuzlocking, at the top of the page is a thread where people grieve for their lost companions, many of which were not run-ending and referred to by their player given name instead of their species. Reading these posts, you can sense the strong attachments from the posters. In a manner that seems similar to a parent sharing a picture of their family, the forum is full of users showing off their named teams after overcoming obstacles during the game. I even took part in this behavior myself, sharing my success after I finished my run to forum users and my Twitter followers, of which you know you can be a part of. There was this nurturing feeling to playing the game that I wouldn't be able to experience without the risk involved, and it only felt natural to take pride in that. During my run, I played more patiently than I ever had in a Pokemon game. I spent hours browsing Bulbapedia before the Elite Four, planning on how I should outfit my squad with the best moves I could muster, and then grinded them for hours so they could stand a chance against the weak. I've written an entire blog post on how I loathe being forced to grind, but by the end of the game I had spent afternoons doing it. Two of my six final Pokemon were fully EV trained, which if you're unfamiliar with a uh, Pokemon's mechanics, that just means I willingly spent four hours of my free time murdering Tentacool for a slightly higher special defense value. I can't even be sure if the extra stat boost mattered at all, but as I ran into close calls during important battles, how else could I reduce the risk? I think, for the three or so weeks of time I spent on my run, I was more attentive to the raising of my Pokemon than I was playing any other RPG to date. All because of this fake mortality pact. I think there's this loose, unspoken idea in the Nuzlocking community where, if you treat your Pokemon as if they're really alive, you aren't looking to beat the game because of the success itself. You're looking to succeed because it's a means of sparing the partners that you play with. I have played many Pokemon games, so the idea of making forward progress is taken for granted by me. 
I must continue, I must face every gym leader and attempt to beat the game. I can't preserve my team just by stopping, because there is more to do. For people that have played so much, and that no longer find any interest in this assumed narrative of rising to become the champion, the Nuzlocke gives us a reason to try our hardest and get invested. To me, playing Pokemon like this flipped the script from experiencing the game's narrative to creating my own, of which the events of Platinum are just a constant series of challenges in the background. Unfortunately, I can no longer feel invested in Cyrus and his cartoonish flunkies wiping out the Pokemon world, but the Nuzlocke taught me that I can still get invested in preventing him from separating me and Cabaret. That feeling was something easily understood from reading the forum accounts and watching Jaden's videos. You can watch our animations to learn the plots of Ruby and Platinum, but nobody watches them for that. The reason that the videos are engaging is due to her own personal story. I like watching her get beaten back, obstacle after obstacle, and seeing if she could persevere. I enjoyed watching her make friends and then subsequently lose them. Nuzlocking improves these games because it overlooks Pokemon's bland narrative in favor of you, the player, and the decisions that you make while playing. You're the one guiding your crew of companions to the end of this terrible death march, and at the end of the day, if one doesn't make it out, you only really have yourself to blame. Just like fucking up in real life, you can't undo it. All you can do is regret it, pay your respects, and try your best next time. This rule set is fantastic, and in a way, I think it's beautiful, because it allowed me the ability to experience an original story I won't be forgetting anytime soon. When the time comes where I get the itch to feel something more real from a game I play, I know I will be going back. And honestly, I can't wait. This has been Out of Characters. Thanks for watching.